It is possible to know what you'd never known before, go where you've never been before, have what you've never had before. It is possible to forget the pains of the past, to sit on the laps of joy and know the favor of God. Something unusual is about to happen. Brace yourself for it. It's the great turnaround. Two days of witnessing the spectacular dreams of God in your life. Date, May 7 and 8, 2022, at the Capstone Church Without Walls, 25 Marquin Street, off Harbert Macaulay Street, Sabu, Yaba, Lagos. It's the annual convention of the Capstone Church Without Walls. Come and have an unforgettable encounter with God. The Great Turnaround. It's possible for me.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you once again to the Capstone Wednesday Boost. Uh, this is a time that we set aside every Wednesday just to help believers, you know, and, and our listeners to help them and to encourage them in their walk of faith with God. It's a time where we help you to increase or to improve on your level of faith in God, where uh, maybe along the line you have uh, been battered and uh, you, you feel discouraged. We hope that at least you will find today's um, session rewarding and um, helpful in encouraging you to remain true to the Lord with all your hearts. And then at the end of the day, you'll be strengthened. Hallelujah. Well, uh, before I go into today's message, I would like to talk about the uh, forthcoming annual convention, which is slated for Saturday 7th May and Sunday 8th of May. Um, it's going to be a great time in God's presence. It's going to be two days of powerful sessions. The theme of, of this year's convention is the great turnaround. And as, uh, as key scripture really is taken from Joshua 3 uh, verse 5, and it says, the Lord will do amazing things among you. And that's what we're believing the Lord for in this new season. God has brought us into a new season of the great turnaround. And I believe that God will do amazing things in my life and your life in the name of Jesus. We want to thank the Lord for, for um, the rally that we did on Sunday. We thank the Lord for good weather. We thank the Lord for it was accident free. There was no problem. And we bless the name of our Lord for that. And we want to thank each and every one of you who participated in that uh, roadshow. And I pray that the Lord God himself will reward your labor of love in the name of Jesus. But the work is not yet finished, you know, because this is just towards, you know, uh, towards the program itself. And so I want to encourage each and every one of us, let's follow up on those who have invited. If you have not invited anybody, please invite people and let's get people, let's get the venue filled. You need to get those guests that you have, you know, invited. You need to get, get the guests confirmed. Let them confirm to you. Let them confirm the attendance, please. It's very important. And we look forward to having a great time in God's presence. I mean, we're, we're going to be having, you know, great, um, great, great ministers at, um, at the conference. We have Prophet Fanny Ekwekurede, who will be speaking to us. Uh, she, she's a prophetess, and she'll be speaking to us. At the convention, we have uh, Pastor Tolu Odukoya Ijogun, who will also be ministering to us. We have Dr. Martin Williams, who will be coming all the way from Nebraska, you know, in the United States of America. And we have Nosa, the psalmist, who will be ministering to us, of course, in song. So it's, it promises to be a great convention. I am excited to be part of it, and I hope that you're, uh, you know, excited too. And, we, and I really look forward, you know, to... Um, to a great time in God's process. Hallelujah. So before we go into today's message, let's just bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Lord, your name is wonderful. We bless you. We honor you today. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for being our God and our Lord and our Master. You alone are God over our lives. You are Lord and our Shepherd, and we appreciate you for all that you, you do in our lives. We thank you for life in all its abundance, Heavenly Father. Father, this is the season of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We just had Easter last week. And so, Father, I want to thank you for the life that we have in Christ Jesus. We thank you for that great sacrifice that, you know, you, you, you paid for us, that we might have our sins forgiven and that we might be redeemed. And so we bless your name. We give you praise, Heavenly Father. And we thank you for the gift of life that we have in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Lord, I commit today's meeting into your hands and I ask that you will do that which only you can do in my life, in the lives of your people, in the name of Jesus. I ask that you will bless them. You bless them indeed, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, as your word goes forth, let it bring deliverance. Let it bring hope. Let it bring, you know, let captives be set free. Let it bring healing. In the name of Jesus, let blind eyes be opened. In the name of Jesus, let the sick be healed. In the name of Jesus, we release resurrection life and power that is in your word to your people. And let it bring glory to you, our God. Father, I yield myself to you and I ask that you will take absolute control of my vocal organ. Lord, let your word 
come with power, that it come with, let it be accompanied with miraculous signs and wonders in the lives of your people in the name of Jesus. Lord, let me speak with your wisdom from above in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. Father, I bless you. For in Jesus' precious name, I have prayed. Amen. And so I want to bring to you a word from the Lord this evening. And I um, bring you a word which are titled, Raising Turnaround Leaders. I mean, it, it takes its root from the convention that we're all looking forward to uh, from 7th and 8th. And I believe that uh, this is the word for the Lord for us in this season in the name of Jesus. Like I said earlier on, our key scripture for this convention is taken from Joshua 3 verse 5. But I want to read from jo Joshua 3 5 to 10. So Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priest, take up the ark of the covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Remember what I said earlier on? The, 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 the theme of the conference is the great turnaround. This is the season where the Lord will do amazing things in our lives. And verse 7 speaks to one of those, I mean, some of those things, what God really wants to do to us. What are those amazing things? One of, one of the key amazing things that God wants to do in our lives is that He wants to begin to exalt us in the eyes of all the people of the earth so that the earth may know that he is with us and he is our God as he was with Moses. Hallelujah. It's such an exciting time to be in. And if I read, you know, um, that verse 7, that verse 7 uh, in New Living Translation, it says, the Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you just I am with Moses. I believe that, that one of the amazing things that the Lord is going to be doing with us in this season is that he's going to make us great leaders. He's going to make us great leaders in the name of Jesus. To the envy of the world, we will be great leaders. God is going to raise great leaders, not only during this convention, even beyond this convention. God is going to raise great leaders amongst us people just to showcase to the world that is going to make us great but at the end of it all God himself will take only the glory hallelujah no man is going to take any glory none of us is going to take the glory God has to take the glory because he wants to make you great so that the people of the world will know that is God and so we must never lose sight of that why God wants to do amazing things because he wants the world to know that he's God so that the world can begin to turn to our God so that they can also be you know uh, be made great leaders and we believe that this is the season that God is raising great turnaround leaders okay for our generation hallelujah you know what God wants to do God wants to turn our lives around and use us to bring glory to his name not for our own glory. No man will take the glory of God. God wants to use us. God wants to turn our lives around. In this season of the great turnaround, God wants to turn our lives around and use us to bring glory to his name. He wants to encourage us. He wants to build us so that we can build his kingdom. You know, we serve a God who is able to take our failures, you know, our disappointments, you know, our defeats and missteps, and still use us to bring glory to his name. Yeah, we might, we might still have our struggles and all that. We might still have our disappointments. But God is, has brought us to a season where he wants to turn everything around for our good. You know, Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things that God works for the good of those who love him. We love God. So he's going to work for our good. He will work for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I believe you and I are called to God's purpose. And God will do amazing things in our lives. Whether you have been walking with the Lord devotedly or faithfully, or you've had a few blunders, you've committed some blunders, okay, or mishaps or whatever, or you have become, you know, casualties in some form or the other, but God still wants to use you in that your situation. And I, and I believe that 
God will do amazing things in the life of you and I in the name of Jesus. Now, when God talks about, you know, making you, he says, I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all his friends. He said, God, this is, God, God is referring to the same greatness that God spoke to Abraham. You know, we are all descendants of Abraham. And so we all can lay claim to the greatness and the blessings of Abraham. We all sing Abraham's blessings are, are mine, are ours. Abraham's blessings are ours. Yes, the same greatness that God spoke to you know, Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 to 5. And I'm going to read that scripture quickly. Then the Lord, the Lord had said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever causes you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And so Abraham left. As the Lord had told him, a lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from, from Haran. So it's never too late. Whether you are 50, 60, 65... It's never too late for God to use you. It's never too late for God to turn your life around. If God could turn the life of Abraham, his, his life, begin to do a new walk in the life of Abraham at the age of 75, God himself will do the same thing in your life in the name of Jesus. And so verse 5 of that scripture says, He took his wife, Sarah, his, his nephew, Lord, all the possessions they had committed and the people they had acquired in Haram, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So God gave an instruction. And Abraham did what? Obeyed. Now, if you read Hebrews 11, 8, you know, verse 8, you know, and, uh, to verse 12. And then we'll now read again verse 17 to 19 of that same scripture. And I'm going to read that. And it says, by faith. And, and this scripture is making reference to that same, you know, Genesis 12, 1 to 5. Okay? The eight, it says, Eight to verse eight to twelve first. So by faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he will later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign land. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him on the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham was a man of faith. Abraham had so much faith in God that even though at a point he was living in tents, okay, even though he was, he was living as a stranger in that promised land, he knew that God has promised him that land and God himself will bring it to pass. And verse 10 of that scripture says, for he was looking for the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Verse 11 says, by faith Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was unable to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants and as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the stand on the seashore. Verse 17 says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God has said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. But Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back to life. I mean, this is about you know, God speaking to Abraham to leave his comfort zone. To leave this land and go to the land, the promised land of Canaan. And it went in obedience to God's instruction. And here again we are told in this as a man of faith. Abraham, the man of faith, was told to kill his son. Whom God had promised him. Through whom God had promised to bring forth offerings that will be so innumerable as the stars in the skies. As the sand at the seashore. You know, and that's how God, and, and Abraham reasoned that God was able to do as he promised. That's what the Bible says. So he became the father of faith. And so the question then is, how do we respond to the call of God upon our lives? How do we do that? Because it is only as we respond to the call, that is what will determine how much of a turnaround we will experience in all aspects of our lives in this season of the great turnaround and beyond. How do we respond? We could see the life of Abraham. 
Abraham responded positively at the sound of every word that you know God you know spoke to Abraham. Abraham responded positively. He took a step of faith. And, and so God is going to be making demands on you and I in this season. And we had better what obey him. Because how we respond to the call of God upon our lives will determine how much of a turnaround we will experience in all aspects of our lives in this season of God. You know, God made the man on Abraham to leave. He did. And the rest is history. He became the father of all nations. He became the father of all faith. We all trace our blessings. We all trace our what? Our greatness to this one man of faith. God made the same, I mean, the same demand on Joshua. That Joshua 5 that we read, God made a demand on Joshua to consecrate the people and he succeeded. And because he obeyed and got the people to obey the Lord, to consecrate themselves, he succeeded in leading the people into the promised land. And so the, 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 the challenge you know, um, for you and I in this season is to listen to the voice, to hear God clearly, and then to follow and to obey the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord, this is what we need in this hour. The voice of the Lord. And as, as we hear his voice, as we obey his voice, and that's how the Lord will do amazing things in our lives. And I pray that the Lord God himself will give you the ears to hear the voice of the Lord as it speaks to you and I in the name of Jesus. The voice of the island, I declare, you will not follow in the name of Jesus. Amen. I mean, we just celebrated Easter. Okay. Your celebration just came out of Easter in a period where we have, it's a time that we set aside, the church sets aside, you know, just to remember, you know, what Jesus Christ really did for us. And I want to read, and I want to quickly read Isaiah 53, just to just remind us once again what we celebrated last week. I believe we're still in this season of the resurrection, you know, life and power of our God. And that's why we believe that this is the season for the great turnaround because that's what Jesus brought to us. The life, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ brought about the great turnaround in our lives. Hallelujah. But let me just quickly read this scripture, Isaiah 53. Okay? Isaiah 53 from verse 1, the whole of Isaiah 53. And it says, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who grew up before him like a tender shoot? He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Okay, now he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we consider him striking by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We, we all, like, the, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of a descendant? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was striking. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offering and, you know, and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Hallelujah. I'm really excited. Anytime I think of what the Lord has done for us, I'm really excited about what God has done. And, and you know, despite the fact that Jesus Christ had equal status with God, Okay, he didn't think so much of himself. 
that they had to cling to the uh, advantages of that status no matter what. But what did he do? From what the scripture has, and we have just read, Isaiah 53, Jesus chose to give life, his life, as a ransom for you and I, as a ransom for the whole world. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus chose from the scripture that we have read, he chose to be humiliated by allowing himself to be bruised for transgressions. That's what he has done. To be crushed for iniquities. And he allowed the chastisement that brought us peace to be placed upon him. Jesus Christ, our Lord, presented himself and shed his blood as an atoning sacrificial lamb of God for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Hallelujah. I'm so excited because in Christ Jesus, we have all our sins forgiven. In Christ Jesus, we have been redeemed to the Lord. Hallelujah. Romans 3, 25 to 26 says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. Through faith in his blood, he did this to demonstrate his justice because of his forbearance he had left for sins committed before. 1 John 2, 2. Again, I read, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for us, for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. For all those, for, so it's not just for our sins, but also for the for, for the sins of unbelievers out there who are yet who are yet to submit, you know, to accept Jesus as their Lord and personal Savior. And so, what am I trying to say? I mean, Jesus chose to do the will of the Father. He chose to do the will of the Father. But I'm thinking so highly of himself. He was willing to pay the price of death rather than clinging to the advantages of being equal with God. Now, the whole world is in crisis today. There are wars, we have pandemics, we have you know, so many crises. And the only solution to the world's crisis is with the church, lies with the church. And so in that Isaiah 53 I just read, you can see clearly how Jesus came so that we can experience. Because he became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so he came so that we can experience that great turnaround. You know, he came. His death, you know, got us transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. What a great turnaround. So Jesus is an epitome of the great turnaround leader. He, he's the great turnaround leader. He's the one that pioneered the great turnaround. And so, and that's why we're believing and trusting the Lord, you know, in this season for us, for God to also do that in our lives. And that's simply just to show that God loves us. All he did is death is to show that God loves us. During his tenure on earth, of course, what did Jesus do? He exemplified the love of God. That's what he did. Okay? For God so loved the world that he gave. So he faced the same difficulties. You know, if you read that, that Isaiah 53, you could see all the difficulties he went through. Okay? So Jesus faced, has faced so many difficulties like we face today. There's so many crises in the world. Even in his time, Jesus had faced same difficulties of life that we face today as revealed. Okay? If you read Hebrews 4.15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet, he did not what? He did not sin. So, Jesus has, is, is, has given us a model. He's given us a pattern, you know, to model ourselves by becoming great tyrant leaders. Hallelujah. Great turnaround leaders. So you and I have no excuse whatsoever not to conform if we're truly committed to the cause of Christ on this earth. 1 John 2, 6 says, Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. If Jesus came to give abundance of life, then we that are in Christ must seek to be the same if we're truly in Christ. 1 Peter 2 21 says, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should what follow in itself. So the goal of every believer is to conform to the image of Christ. Hallelujah. Conform to the image of Christ. So imitating Christ calls for what? For self-sacrifice and requires giving God's will more consideration above our personal will. 
Hallelujah. We're not called to be seekers of blessings of God. God is going to bless us, no doubt. God has brought us to a season where he's going to turn our lives around. But God has not called us, you know, to, to be seekers of blessings. But God wants us, God wants to raise, turn around, you know, leaders in us who will be willing to assert themselves for the will of the Father of Earth. That's what God wants to do in you and I. That's what he wants to do in our lives. He wants to raise in us turnaround leaders, those who will go and do the same that he did for, for us. So in this season of kingdom advance and expansion, this is just the way to go. Hallelujah. But the question then is, if Jesus did not give your life a great turnaround that we all enjoy today, when you were yet in sin, that's, what, that's when Jesus, we didn't deserve it when Jesus you know, did all he did for us. We did not deserve it. But the question then is, where will you have been today if Jesus have not done what he did for us? You know, I'm very much aware, I'm very much aware that we all still have our challenges. I'm very much aware. I'm not ignorant of that. I'm very much aware that things are still, you know, difficult. There are things that we're still believing God, you know, God to do in our lives. And as long as we're in this world, you know, Jesus said, you know, we will have problems, we'll have challenges, we will have tribulations, okay, and challenges. But one thing we do is that we must always take solace in the reassuring word of the Lord that we should always take courage. Why? Because we have overcome the world. Hallelujah. But what really can compare to being turned, you know, to, uh, to being turned around from eternal damnation? Because don't forget that Christ died when we're in sin. So we were heading towards, we were, we were heading towards eternal damnation. But Christ came and gave us that great turnaround. He turned our lives around, you know, from going to hell, and then he gave us life. And so the question then is, what can really compare to that? What can compare to being turned around from eternal damnation or death to eternal life? In Christ Jesus, what can compare to having our names written in the book of life? Nothing, absolutely nothing, can compare to that. Okay, and so we have an assignment. You and I have an assignment that God has, I mean, that God has given us, and 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 I want us to look at that assignment today. Okay, Jesus tells us in Matthew six thirty three that we must seek. Okay, we must seek the kingdom of God and righteousness and all these things shall be added to, to us because we must learn to prioritize, hmm? to prioritize. We must reorder our priorities and that's what God is asking us to do. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. If we really want to, you know, to live, um, um, uh, we want to experience this great turnaround in our lives, that God is promising on this season, then we must learn to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness so that all the great things that God has promised, all the amazing things that God has promised you know, to do for us this season will be added to us. Now, so striving daily to be in right standing with God through our obedience to the word of God and answering the call of God upon our lives by engaging in ministry to others. You know, is the absolute most important thing that we can, you and I can do in this season. Everything else springs from this. It springs from our ministry, our service. Okay? So, um, 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 so our purpose is what? Is to please the king. We do not exist for the king to please us. Most people struggle with God because they are yet to what? To daily make, you know, Placing the king is the primary reason for living. And so, availing oneself to God and soul winning. So, one of the things you can do is to, is to be involved in soul winning. So, availing oneself to God and soul winning and discipleship of new converts so that they too can one day begin to win lost souls and disciple other new Christian converts. All believers are called in different capacities you know, to be witnesses of the truth. That's what we're called to do. The truth of the gospel. Now, doing the work of evangelism is a command for all believers. And so, we are all called to witness to unbelievers. So, winning souls and disciples, if made a priority, opens us, 
opens you and I to the flow of God's abundant blessings to our lives. Those great, amazing things. It opens us to those great, amazing things that God wants to do. So we must always consciously make it our first priority to engage in the work of God's kingdom in our life if we really want to walk in the true abundant blessings of God in this season of the great turnaround, in this season of kingdom advance. God wants to advance his kingdom through us. God wants to advance his kingdom through you and I. And we must not fail God. So we must seek to delight ourselves in the Lord. Then God will grant the desires of our heart. And that's what Psalm you know, 37 uh, verse 4 really says. We must seek you know, to desire, eh, to delight you know, ourselves in the Lord. And that's the only way that God will grant our heart desires. Our prayers must not be only on early things. We need to move. Mm? All we need to do, we just we need. So selfishness, self-centeredness holds us back from being engaged in the advancement of God's kingdom in our lives. And so all selfish tendencies need to die. Hallelujah. All we need to do, we just need to, we, I mean, we must put them all to death. We must seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. Now, righteousness means to be in right standing or right relationship with God. And this calls for total obedience. To be in right standing with God calls for total obedience to God's word and instruction. That is the key to righteousness. We cannot claim to be righteous and then we live contrary to God's word. The Bible clearly instructs us on what is pleasing to God and what is not pleasing. Of course, what is not pleasing to God, it calls what? Sin. And so we can afford or it causes sin or disobedience. So we can afford to live a life of disobedience. And that's why the main scripture for our convention this year, which is taken from Joshua 3 and verse 5. Verse 5 says, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will what? Will do amazing things among you. So consecrating our lives requires that we deliberately make it our number one priority to always allow and cooperate with the Holy Spirit daily so that he can help us put sin to death in our lives. Now, Jesus promises us that if we will make his kingdom and righteousness our top priority, then that great turnaround that we so desire in this season, we will experience it. Hallelujah. Other things we need to make to make it in life will come much easier for us. Okay? As we seek God's Righteousness, as you seek his kingdom, as we make it a priority, every other thing will just fall in place. Why? Because God is committed to making his abundant blessings a reality in our lives. Hallelujah. Now, believers became, we all became righteous by reason of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? Once we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we what? What we become? We became the righteousness of God. Hallelujah! And you know the Bible says that the one who knew no sin became sin that we might that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So then God expects us to walk in total obedience to His command by relying on His grace. So we must confess and totally what renounce or forsake sin, so that our lives can bring glory to God at all times. Sin cuts short the flow of God's blessing. That's what sin does. It cuts short the flow of, God, of, of God's divine blessings in the, into our lives. And so we must, therefore, walk diligently with the author and finisher of our faith to put to death the sins that so easily entangles us. Now, this season of the great turnaround that God has brought us into is a season of power. It's a season of the presence of God. It's a season of possibilities, great possibilities. You know, the Bible says that with God, nothing shall be impossible to them that believe. And so, it is the great around season for us. And we declare it is possible for us. Hallelujah. It's a season where all things are possible. Now, a major key to living in the reality of the great and of God's blessing is embracing the seemingly impossible task of taking the world, taking our nation, taking our community, taking our state, taking, taking for God. Hallelujah. 
the major key to living in reality of that gritty is, is embracing that you know, seemingly impossible task of taking our nation for God. It may look impossible, but it's possible because with God on our side, we can move mountains. Hallelujah. Now, what you have noted uh, is that the, the gospel of the kingdom is not just about winning souls for Christ. We're, we're told to win souls, but it goes much more than that. The kingdom of God goes beyond the salvation of individual people and then extends to the complete and total transformation of nations or peoples. Hallelujah. And that's where the great turnaround comes in. That's where God is raising in us great turnaround leaders. Hallelujah. And that's why Jesus commanded us. He said, we must watch make disciples of all nations. It's Matthew, that's in the book of Matthew 28, 19. It says, make disciples of all nations. And we cannot afford to fail God, to fail him in this great assignment or commission. Hallelujah. Now, Micah 4, 1 to 2, and then Isaiah 2, 2. If you read those two scriptures, it says, in the last days, it speaks about in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the Lord, to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. It says, he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his path. The law will go out of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And when we read Revelations 11, 15, it says, The seven angels sang his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven. We said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of our Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. And so Jesus has commanded us to make disciples of our nations. So that people can begin to say, come, let's go to the mountain of the Lord. Let's go to the house of the God of Jacob. So that people can begin to come and ask us to teach them the way of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Wisdom here is manifested by winning souls. We must win souls because that's what God has called us to. Now, leading people to the Lord and seeing their lives changed and transformed by the power of the good news, by the power of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, should be our primary focus in this season of great turnaround. Okay? God is calling us to get, to get people's lives turned around for good. People's lives must be turned around from darkness to light. It is when we make the kingdom of God our, our primary focus and the object of our desire that the fullness of God's blessings will be made manifest in our lives. Now, the greatest testimony anybody hmm, anybody can give about you is how their lives have been turned around. How God has used you to turn their lives around just by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? The greatest testimony people can give about you is how their lives have been turned around through the gospel of Jesus Christ that they have received through you during our upcoming convention and beyond. And so, um, in this season of this great turnaround, beyond this convention, you and I are called God is enlisting us into the assignment of preaching the gospel and bringing people into the kingdom of God. Okay, and, and that is God's priority, bringing people into his kingdom. And not just bringing them to the kingdom, but also discipling them. And that's what is revealed to us in Revelations 14, 14 to 16. We must bring people into the kingdom. It says, I looked and there before me was a white cloud. And sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth 
is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Luke 10, 2 to 3 says he told them, the harvest is plentiful. This is Jesus. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Now, Matthew 23, 18 to 20, you know, speaks to the fact that, yes, God is not just sending us into the field into the field, into the harvest field, to bring in the harvest, to reap the harvest. No, God is also empowering us for this assignment. And that's what Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says. Then Jesus, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And Matthew 24, you know, 14 says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testament to all nations, and then the end will come. So the truth of the matter is that the whole earth is yet to hear of Jesus. It is time for us to advance the gospel of the kingdom to the whole world in this season of the great turnaround. In these days of prevalent and advancing evil, there's so much evil these days. There's pandemic, there's terrorism. Nations are fighting against nations. There, you know, there are wars, there are economic uncertainty, there are moral decline, family breakdown. So many people are fearful. It is time for the kingdom of God to advance. Hallelujah. It must advance in our personal lives, in our marriages, in our homes, in our businesses, in the marketplace, in our schools, in the media, in the government institutions, the kingdom of God, in our cities, in our communities, in every facet of society. The kingdom of God needs to advance. And it's only you and I that can make that happen. Hallelujah. For every true believer in Christ, this is not the time to retreat. This is the hour to advance God's kingdom. God has brought us into the season of the great turnaround and we must not, you and I must not, we must not fail God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We must anticipate a time when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God. Because that's where we're going. The kingdoms of this world will ultimately become the kingdom of our God. So we must anticipate it. We must see it coming with the eye of faith. When Satan's kingdom will be cast down and Christ's kingdom will be established forever as revealed to us in Revelations 11, 15. Now, Revelation 11, 15 says, the seven angels sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in the heaven which said the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever so we cannot but be hopeful and, and persevere in the task of advancing God's kingdom now we see with the eye of faith we must see with the eye of faith and we must know that victory in our Lord Jesus Christ is inevitable so the question is, how many people have you really invited for this great convention that we're having on the 7th and then the 8th of May this year? How many have you invited? How many? Have you invited at least five people? Well, that should be your minimum. At least five people to the com convention. And I pray that the Lord God himself will help you and I as you obey, you know, uh, is called upon our lives in the name of Jesus. So I just want us to quickly just spend a few minutes, you know, praying and asking the Lord. As I bring this meeting to a close, I want us to just spend a few minutes, the next few minutes, just to pray to seek the face of the Lord concerning um, what God is doing in our lives in this season. Let's appreciate our God for those all inspiring you know, testimonies, the healings, the deliverances, the breakthroughs that God is going to bring into, you know, to us in this season. Let's thank the Lord for new cycles of victory, for fresh start, for new seasons of possible, for great turnarounds in every aspect and facet of our lives. Let's thank Him for a new season of making you know, the impossible possible. Let's thank Him for reversing the irreversible, for destroying long-standing yokes and generational causes. Let's thank the Lord for using us for massive salvation of souls, both online and in person. Let's thank the Lord. Let's thank the Lord. Lord, we thank you for invading our lives. 
with miraculous signs and wonders. We thank you for bringing us into this new season. We thank you, Lord, for the new beginnings. Thank you, Lord, especially for the road show that we had on Sunday. Thank you for making it accident-free. Thank you for stopping the hand of evil. Thank you because there was no evil, no evil surprises. Thank you for keeping your people and delivering us from evil on the roads. We want to thank you once again for favorable weather on Sunday. We thank you. And so far, in the name of Jesus, we declare that for the two-day convention, we pray and declare that we will have the same favorable weather in the name of Jesus. We activate God's angels to ensure that every weather element complies and works for the good of this great general convention. And there will be no rains. There will be no thunderstorms. There will be no lightning. On the two days of the program in the name of Jesus, we place a restraining order on the works of darkness for the days concerning the weather in the name of Jesus. Lord, as we, as we put things in place, we pray that we will have excellent weather conditions for the convention in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit to draw people that were rich during the road show. There are people that have been rich during the road show, Lord. This last Sunday, Father, we pray that Every soul that was reached will come for the conference in the name of Jesus. We pray that the souls will be added to the church and the body of Christ in the name of Jesus. That everyone that was reached to that ratio will come, will attend. We pray for a great harvest of souls for this convention. Thank you, Father, for that great harvest that is ripe and ready. Father, we pray for harvesters to be released from within us, starting from you and I. Starting from us, O oh God, to bring them a harvest of souls to the Lord during this convention and beyond the convention in the name of Jesus. We pray that the Lord of the harvest will use this great turnaround convention to depopulate hell and to hell bound people and then to cause them to be in the light. We pray that the Lord God Himself will grant us in the capstone fresh zeal and grace to attract and to seek and to pursue people, especially on church and unbelievers, for this convention using the anvils and all our positive materials in the name of Jesus. Father, we just want to say thank you for this great uh, meeting. We thank you. We thank you because we know that your kingdom will be established through the convention, the two-day convention in the name of Jesus. Father, we declare, let your will be done and let your counsel be established in the name of Jesus. We bless you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your word, O oh God. Thank you for the new work you're doing in our lives, O oh God. Thank you for the hearts that have been touched tonight, O oh God. Thank you for that great turnaround that you've begun in our lives. We bless you. We honor you. Thank you for the amazing things you're going to do, O oh God. You already started doing and that you will still do. We bless you because we know that you're a God and will do exceedingly abundantly. Far above we could ever ask or imagine to the glory of your name. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Let your name be glorified and let your name be exalted. For in Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Amen. Have a lovely evening. God bless. I can see everything turning. I see everything turning. I see everything turning around for my good. Everything is turning around for my good. Come 7th and 8th of May, it is the annual convention of the capstone and God is set to do a new thing in your life. I'm inviting you specially and I want you to join me. We're going to have a lot of great speakers Prophetess Fanny, we're going to have Pastor Tolu Odukoya Jogo, Dr. Martin Williams, and you're going to have Pastor Tokumba Johnson and myself. We're going to have Minister Nosa in music. You don't want to miss it. Do you want to turn around? Do you want to break through? Do you want divine intervention? That is going to happen for you on the 7th and 8th of May at the capsule, 25 McCoin Street, Sabo Alagumiji, Java, Lagos. Everything is turning around for my good. What can separate, separate me from the love of Christ?
Christ What can stand against Stand against the perfect love of life Though the storms and ocean rise Still on him I'll keep my eyes Is every word my guiding light Oh, I'm one with the Lord by covenant And of this I am confident He will perfect what he began Oh, 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 oh. so what shall we say to thee? Treasure deep inside 